Task Force report. Thank you very much to um, Bob and the uh, staff of the State Auditor's Office. It was a uh, interesting adventure right around uh, <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> but the report got out uh, on time. On time, on budget. Um, you all got copies, I think, on paper and electronically. It's on the auditor's website, and it's also on the um, HBTF website. Um, PBN picked up the story, and actually I saw it on um, at least one national place that, that tracks sort of broadband stuff pick up the story out of PBN, I think. Um, so I think we're, we're on our way as, as far as um, we got with that. Um, we have minutes. To, we have one set to be approved. Yes, is that from, right? from November, November 29th, which right. uh, were sent out. Yes. Any comments on those? Oh, okay. I think we're two sets back. Now. Comments on the November 29 minutes? Okay. Uh, is there a motion to pursue? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. Um, okay, with permission, maybe we'll finish our business while we finish fussing with the projector there. Um, working group updates. Um, I know that um, Clyde has an update on the what's going on in other states task force or, or working group. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, David. Um, in December, Marlon Wiedemeyer. Uh, Marlon is with the Hawaii Educational Networking Consortium. He and I met with Ann Neville from uh, the California Broadband Task Force. Uh, she's the administrator for that group. And uh, Anne was in town uh, on vacation, and she was gracious enough to come and uh, meet with Marlon and I. And we had a actually a very, very productive meeting. She was very informative in, in how California approached their study. Um, I think in the prior meetings, uh, Senator Fukunaga mentioned that the California um, draft report was online and accessible through our website. Uh, what Anne notified us was she said that their report, their final report, will be very much different than what's posted on the website currently. So she said for us to keep an eye out in uh, early to mid-January for their final report, which would be a bit more comprehensive and may take uh, actually a very different tack than it, it does in their uh, preliminary draft form. But she mentioned a couple of things. She mentioned um, the fact that they did consider using the services of uh, the Connected, Connected Nation, I think, uh, Brent Legs organization. But California felt that because of the size of their state and uh, activities and the experience of Connected Nation, California chose to do their own um, actual uh, fact finding and data gathering. Um, so although they're doing it in house, they're taking the same approach. They're trying to map um, areas of their state that have access to broadband versus areas that don't. And what are the issues that uh, prevent deployment in certain areas? Um, she also mentioned that California is focusing on um, their, their primary um, objective, obviously, is access to broadband for their residents. But they're also looking at economic development issues as well as uh, build out of their infrastructure. So, um, again, it was very uh, informative for Ma and I to sit down and just kind of get a take on where California is coming from, how they're approaching it. And um, we are looking forward to seeing that report. And we'll be doing follow-ups with her um, as our activities progress during the year. Um, regarding Ohio, and I mentioned this to David before the start of the meeting, um, I contacted um, Ohio. But in the, in the meeting that we had with Brent Lake, uh, he mentioned that they recently signed Ohio. So um, it's probably more productive for me to work through Brent to get updates on the various other states that are, are on the contract with his organization than to try to contact the state directly. So that's how we'll be approaching uh, those states that are using Connected Nation to develop their, their strategies. So, um, the last comment is that uh, Senator Fukunaga has a 
working relationship with North Carolina. She did make contact with Jane Patterson, I believe it is. Um, but I, again, have not been able to uh, get in touch with Jane, so we'll be following up with North Carolina as well. So. Thanks. Anybody else? Uh, you know, does anybody feel guilty that they didn't work on this over the holidays? <laughs> 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 Any other working groups have anything? Um, I have a brief comment. Joel, even modest as he is, uh, actually did work over the holidays and <laughs> sent several notes asking questions about next steps in data collection, which um, we, we sort of put off trying to get the final report out. Um, but I did get an estimate from um, Brent Legg, who had agreed to give us an estimate, and I will um, I'll share that with task force members. Roughly speaking, um, the estimate was 115,000 to do an initial mapping, similar to what we saw they've done for other states, and that would include um, a year of quarterly updates. And um, 115,000 for the demand side survey of adoption, uptake, reasons why people do or don't. So again, per our discussion, those are just informational numbers and obviously, if the task force were to decide it wants to do that, um, we would need both the funding and we would need to go through a procurement process to select an entity which might or might not be connected uh, nation. But at least this gives us a feel for what it would cost from at least one source for, for our planning purposes. Um, okay, with that, um, any other updates from any members on anything? And we're ready to go? Good deal. Okay, so that was pretty good timing. Um, without further ado, let me introduce James Hetrick, who is the CEO of Information Systems Management. Okay. Pretty good? Close enough. Okay. I, okay. Yeah, close enough. Um, and I should acknowledge um, James was introduced to us by Ingalls and McCoy. And maybe you can introduce yourself and um, um, describe what you do, but um, the, the focus of this is really on uh, ways in which fiber can be deployed uh, to the home, and that's the area that James has been working in in a number of communities um, at the community level and development level, and I better not say much more or I'll make even more mistakes. No, no, no. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, the background is uh, I was with the city of Loma Linda, California for 11 years as their CIO. Um, so pretty well steeped in the, the local politics side of things and the local government side of things. Um, in that process, we ended up building a fiber in the home network, uh, and we'll talk about a few of those things that kind of translate over. Uh, but having dealt with the city, having dealt with 14 developers, having worked through the economic development strategy, and then I left the city uh, about a year ago uh, and have been working through the process of, of helping other cities um, kind of figure out where they're going to go how they're going to do that. We also work with uh, developers uh, in that arena, and we work with uh, utility districts, um, both for connectivity as well as uh, kind of supporting those utilities for power and for water. So we describe ourselves in a kind of a unique way. Um, we're really a telecommunications ecosystem architectural firm. So the idea here is that we're, we're working through the issues of what it takes to really design and deploy fiber optic and wireless for future generation data services. We do that through a process called the Comprehensive Communication Planning Process, which includes everything from financial modeling and business planning, the strategic infrastructure and communications master planning concepts. So the idea of all of this is economic development. That's really the only reason that uh, communities and, and states and counties are working through this process, is that they know that they need to do that to stay competitive in the global economy. So I took a took liberty of going to your website and looking at where you're where you're at in your task force charter, and then broke out you know kind of the uh, the five items that are condensed into three bullet points on your website and said so okay let's look at those and I can I can talk about those points so that they hopefully make sense in the context of what we've been discussing, not being privy to all the previous discussion. But very basically, removing barriers to broadband access and gaining wider access to public right away, identifying opportunities to increase broadband development and adoption, um, identifying opportunities for increased broadband for high speed, and then enabling the creation and development of a new advanced communication technology. And 
The last bullet point to me struck as really an economic development pitch, so I geared it around that. And I said, well, let's talk about what it really takes to do those things. And what it's going to take for you to be able to do that, obviously, is a plan. And just like the state has to do land use plans and general plans for cities and counties, you also have you know, the necessity to do a communication plan. Well, these communication plans, basically what they're designed to do is to basically find the appropriate application of resources contextually within the environment that they occur, um, provide efficient design deployment and operational strategies, improve efficiency and operations, generate revenue from new sources that you're not used to seeing them from, and I have some examples for you, provide new opportunities for economic development, we'll say that about 25,000 times, um, add networking capabilities um, that are scalable far into the future. The idea here is to prepare something um, that's scalable for you and will design in both uh, all layers. The connectivity uh, of dynamic, dynamically flexible. So we can do this. This is the key. Provide as many services to as many groups as possible and generate economic development dollars doing so. So there's lots of players that you're not used to seeing. We'll go through some of those. The community has a real voice in what happens. Um, I think that's important and that your network is both um, economically and technically sustainable. Integrated usage models, application service tools, citizen satisfaction results, digital divide address, economic viability address, and the idea behind what it really can be done in the private-public partnership. So, free of charge, I'll give you the first bullet points um, on <laughs> phase one and phase two. <laughs> These, um, they're somewhat obvious. Uh, the order in which they occur is, is key. And uh, I'll just say, uh, looking at Connected Nations and what they're doing and they're going to get funding is a great idea because it fits with the second bullet point on the list, is you have to figure out what your infrastructure assessment tools are. So we go through this process and we look through all the documents and existing plans, which includes all the GIS layers that are available um, for the government entity. Um, I did, um, for the state of California, the GIS for all the cultural and archaeological resources in the state of California. So that means all of LA, Mojave Desert, the five military bases, 13 universities, um, San Francisco, San Diego. And we created a GIS database that, that basically allowed those, all those shared groups to utilize that um, for asset management of the <coughs> cultural resources. So I understand the importance and how hard it's going to be for you to find the right group that can integrate this with the GIS programs that the state and counties have. Um, so we're a big advocate of that. That comes in in the document review. You've got the next one already underway, which is getting the assessment. The other one, the next one is a service assessment. You may find that, that there's a lot of um, disparity between the services. One marketed and two attainable. Um, the next bullet point, we go through an economic, demographic, and market uh, summary. Um, Part of my background is I helped co-write a book called Mexico and Mexico City and the Global Economy. Um, it was a study that looked at all of uh, what NAFTA did for Mexico as a country. And we go through some of the same methodologies for economic and demographic um, studies. We do that for the city and help them understand where their, the flex points are within those things. The trans-sectoral analysis piece basically takes the, the 21 industry categories that are in the Census Bureau and how those are reflected in a, a regional perspective and gives you a weighted way to say who are we and where are we focused today and is that where we want to be in the future and how dependent are we on those things. We do a, a strengths and weaknesses assessment and that's kind of brutal um, because people don't always want to, don't want to hear what they're bad at or what they have to work on but it's a necessary evil. Um, then we go through um, the whole process of what's cumulatively coming together as a vision and how that strategically works. Then you go through this process of doing a business, financial and business model. Then you continue to have the stakeholder summit or summits depending upon the environment. And then you put together some sort of preliminary schedule and milestones so that you can figure out what you can do in phase two. Phase two of a plan basically says, hey, let's take a look at all the implementation options that are out there. Let's look at the advanced services that we would want to uh, entail. And if you can think about this, what you're really trying to settle up on is what economic development incentives are out there and what services are going to bring about those incentives. Right? So at the end of the day, it really the discussion has to start around service offerings. 
And so you get your political framework together, uh, which is phase one, and then you start looking at these all at the same time and, and kind of bring them back together. So the advanced service offerings, we, what can we count, who can we count sitting at the table with us? Then we go through the technology solution review process, which we try to keep that in the vendor evaluations and management structures so that we understand um, kind of where we're going to hang our hat on what technology, what vendors, what distribution channels, what accountability we have for warranty, things like that. Go through kind of how to manage it, operate it. Um, go through the financing options, and I'll let you know up front. There are multiple groups that uh, I have contact with that will help finance community-based networks if the model is together and the plan is right. So this doesn't necessarily have to be something that the state has to you know, put dollars out for, just authority to be able to negotiate for. Same with, same with other cities, and at smaller levels too. So updated financial business models. So we take the previous one, we're validating assumptions the whole time through, and the model continues to change. Um, and <coughs> as you get to this point, you pretty much have nailed what it's going to cost, who your partners are, and how you're going to do it. And then you we update the schedule and milestones, and you move on to some form of deployment um, at whatever partnerships we have created at that time. Um, and <coughs> we've yet been in discussion with the community that can do it all the same way. So there's no replication. Every community is unique. Uh, and I haven't found any sort of cutter method yet, um, unfortunately. So um, I think politics are just different everywhere. So one of your bullet points says, enable the creation and development of new advanced communication technologies. I didn't put these in order because I felt it was a better way to address some of the questions. One, um, it'll be possible with the advent of new markets. And what we're talking about new markets is developing arenas that really deal with the environmental issues we're going to have to deal with. Healthcare, education, public safety, commercial, residential, local, state, and federal government interfacing. Right? So when we say comprehensive communication, we're talking really about how do you facilitate connectivity from air for everybody? just like you do for streets, just like you do for other assets, other infrastructure pieces that you build. The new market is to enable the local needs. Um, one of the things that is, is being missed um, as a huge segment um, for the community. And that means community needs, neighborhood needs, which translates well back to developers. Uh, we're going to build those new communities and back to new workforces. Economic development today is not about square footage, and buildings. It is about maintaining the workforce. Um, and so that has shifted in the last 10 years, basically because there is no job that doesn't require some level of computer interface um, somewhere. So I'm going to challenge you to rethink some things. And this is a whole process of, of uh, kind of a paradigm shift from going in stovepipes of what you're used to thinking um, to kind of more of a parallel process where instead of thinking in departmental sort of structures, you're actually thinking in these parallel things of, you know, across going, how can we work together to sort through um, the issues for the supplier and the partners and the, uh, the workforce? So I may, may lose you a little bit here. Let's just do an assumption here. And Doc Searles did a book a few years ago called The Food Sharing Manifesto. And his comment on the bestseller basically said, you know what? Communities will make more money because of their infrastructure than they will with the infrastructure. And what he's basically saying is that toll roads are great to build, um, but what really brings dollars in is the businesses that exist off of those streets. So if you can not charge the toll and have the businesses be there, you're going to make a lot more money. Um, I think there's a fundamentally sound logic in that, and we've seen it. So what are we doing? We're building an ecosystem, which is economic development. What is an ecosystem? It's a biological community, it's people, right? Interacting organisms, again, communications, and their physical environment, how we accommodate for that. We've done it over centuries in many, many different forms in many, many different ways, and every culture has done it differently. But unfortunately today, we're kind of tied into the technology that exists and we have to utilize it. What is the edge? What's the power of the end user, right? Now, some of you may have heard some of these, and I won't spend the time going through all of them. But I just want you to understand, you know, YouTube sold for $1.4 billion um, and has a significant impact in, in revenue and advertising. Facebook is also doing very well. Obviously, Google's doing well. Microsoft is doing fairly well with the Windows Live platform. iTunes is, Apple's doing great. And 
we just see all of a sudden that the content no longer is coming through a gatekeeper, but we see that the edge is starting to play a serious role, and not just uh, not just un uh, unnoticed. Second Life has somewhere in the realm of 20 people who have made over a million dollars in the real world by providing services in a virtual world. So um, that trend is going to continue, and I think when you saw Mercedes and a bunch of other car manufacturers start to build small little cars and place them in the virtual world to do advertising, it should have shifted your mind a little bit on what the potential is. So multiple examples, and that was just a quick little Surrey idea. There's thousands of them that are out there. We've heard convergence to the point where we're sick of it, um, but the, the ideas are, are sound in that the platforms of what we're talking about are all merging together, the industries are starting to mesh, and they're all, they're all moving towards this middle spot, which is a sweet spot. Um, and it's a sweet spot for, for economies. And we're seeing major companies make changes to how they do business in order to do that. Well, that gives us an indication why. Well, we have a problem in the labor force, and you're going to see it um, hit your <coughs> all others, and that is that the population growth for need um, isn't staying up with the skilled labor force. And so as this gap, where we're right at the beginning of the gap showing, we already feel the pressure. We're going to have to make adjustments along the way for the labor source that's available. And as the economy becomes more global in nature, we're going to see those opportunities um, for skilled labor um, be more transient across political boundaries. Um, so the need is not going to change. We just know that this has to be filled some way. And if you're proactive about filling it, you stand a chance in economic development. If you're reactive in filling it, you're probably going to lose the battle. So, the new ecosystem basically is going to be built around developers. They're going to be the leaders in establishing the locations that are going to kind of stand out as economic centers. We've seen that in the last few years. Um, it takes their partnership and it takes their incentive to make that happen. Um, and so they become key partners to be thinking about in the future. And that new ecosystem basically is built of some components that you need to understand the relationships to each other. Let's just talk about the developer relationship, and the yellow bubble behind there is called technology, and it's a technology company sort of solution, right? It can stand for a cable company or, or a, um, a telco, or it can stand for um, a local community network or whatever. The point is, is that all of those things are built upon the choices in technology. So the relationship between developers and their choices of technology that they make available to their end users creates um, a Venn diagram. I, and I don't want to, everybody understands Venn diagrams. We know that there's actually four categories that are here. There's the developer, there's the technology circles independently, that's two. There's the overlap where they touch, that's three. And there's the outside boundary that they don't inhabit, that's four. So when we go through and we look at these relationships for economic development, we need to understand something. That, that literally the combinations equal four. But what happens when you add a third component to economic development? Just adding local governments layer or what they can facilitate, you end up with three entities. So now you have 27 possibilities besides four. Are all of them monetary? No. But there's more than four. What happens if we have a fourth component, a utility? What do we get? 256. Right? By now you've figured out the pattern and you know that the more components that we add, the multiplication effect of the relationships get much, much more complicated and more variation and therefore more opportunity. I did one more just to be fun. Let's <laughs> add major partnerships with the corporation. The numbers start to get big. 3,125. So we can't be thinking anymore about, well, let's pair off because that doesn't create enough synergy. We have to be thinking how we come together and sit at the table and do things for mutual benefit if we're going to compete in a global economy. So. We live in a system different than a national um, government, which can basically dictate uh, what the standard's going to be and how they're going to do it, so they get to move that faster than we do. So we have to partner to have that synergy. Well, we have four choices, really, of how we're going to deal with the future. That is, we're going to either be in an open world, which is you know open platform, internet light, but you know has this communication centric. We're either going to be in a messaging world, which is media-centric and kind of has some internet flavor to it. We're going to be in today's world, if we just stay there, where it's closed system, telco-like, but communication-centric. Or we're going to live in a walled garden world, 
right? Where we create this sort of media-centric, closed environment where we can do what we want to do. We really only have those four choices um, unless we decide to overlap our Venn diagrams right over the center of them for different purposes. Then what happens? You take your five and you multiply it by the four other options you have and all of a sudden the variables just start to go crazy. So with that in mind, we say, well, how do we increase the, de the, de the development and the adoption of these sorts of networks? And really what it means is the tagline that I ended up creating after many, many months of discussion was we need to figure out how to think beyond just broadband. Because broadband in itself is an accommodation of just taking phone and making it something different. Beyond broadband is about connectivity. And it means all connectivity, fiber, wireless, telco, cable, whatever it takes to get the job done. But we have to break out of that and we have to think beyond it. Because if we think that it's connectivity, we start to realize that there's some components in here that are really essential. One, nobody's going to answer this question and say, is connectivity essential? Anybody going to say no? I don't know anybody who says no. If they did, it would say, well, fine. And as a group, stop and go do something else. Why waste our time doing this? If it is essential, then are the current compact capabilities sufficient? Well, another problem is we wouldn't be having a discussion like this today if that was sufficient. There wouldn't be a need to have the discussion. It would already have occurred. Um, lots of discussion on why and how and all that. That's for another time. But if it is sufficient, go do something else. If it's not sufficient, we have to basically, well, will they respond to us? Well, they can't respond to us unless we give them a plan. We, ask, we have to ask them what they're, what they're going to do. If they will pony up and do that which they're being asked to do, when, if they will, then we're okay. Let them, let them do it and hold them accountable and move on. If they won't do it, you have to ask, well, can the, can the community, and by that the broadest sense, can the community, can the, the local government and other entities, NGOs, other people, can they play? Can they, are they allowed to play? If the answer is no, then you know what, you just got to go check the legal limits of what they can and can't do, seek alternatives, figure out a new strategy. If they can play, get the plan. <laughs> we keep coming back to a plan, right? So nothing happens without a good plan. So if you develop the action plan, you really kind of have a role in the government entity to play one of four roles, a facilitator, enabler, wholesaler, or retailer of services. They're not mutually exclusive, and they don't have to be, um, they don't have to be in, the, in the way that you approach it. Facilitator, we all know that basically encourages private entities to increase public services. Enabler basically helps with building codes, constructions, um, you know, pre-approved zonings. Get the burden, get the hurdles out of the way, like your mission statement says. What can we do to get the hurdles out of the way? That's being an enabler. <coughs> um, they don't, I found it interesting that the assumption in the, the task was to enable. So you already have been directed to figure out how to enable. The question is, you already know you're a facilitator. The questions that you're really struggling with are going to be, do you play a role in the facilitation as a wholesaler or a, uh, a retailer of services? Um, and not just the traditional telephone cable TV services, but other services. So that's really the question of what you're discussing. So again, you'll see this a million times. Think beyond broadband and think about your community-based networking. Because when you see a picture like that, you immediately think of a, a nice old lady who's sitting in front of it, plugging in your calls. What makes that nostalgic for you? Anybody have a sense of that? The person who used to sit there. Oh, right. Why? Because they were a part of the community. Why didn't we mind that person sitting there patching our phone calls and could listen to them at the same time? Because we trusted them. They were a part of the community. As the architecture and as technology kind of grew, we lost that sense of that communications is about the community and the message that stays within the community. And it got moved out to the further edges, which creates a set of problems for us. And so, you know, I'm irritated when I'm in California <coughs> and a phone switch goes down in Atlanta and I'm out of service. Uh, it's not my community. What do I care what happens in Atlanta? I mean, I just want to make a phone call. Um, or I want to use the internet, or I want to do something else, and I, I'm, I'm irritated by that. So I think there's something that strikes a chord with us, that it, there is something about communication as a principle of us 
having the ability to share ideas with those of like mind and doing that in a safe environment in our own local community. So from that standpoint, it's nostalgic. Well, it's not necessarily, you know, the question is what are we going to do to enable networks? And that is, we have to look at the options of how do you do standard-based deployments of those? How do you figure out what your minimum future residential requirement is going to be? How do you figure out what your commercial requirements are going to be? How are you going to deal with your right-of-way requirements, which is specific to your directives? And better options for um, service provider enabling or facilitating or, or other options. And how do you basically innovate new applications and services? Again, full circle back to economic development comes into being applications and services. So infrastructure is a huge component to this, and that means that we're going to talk about the layers in the technology world. Um, it, you know, depending upon who you talk to, let's just say layer zero. Um, the bottom layer of all of this is dirt. Fundamentally dirt. We've got to do something with it. We've got to control it. The thing about layers is if you control the bottom layer, you control all the ones above it. If you sacrifice the layers below it, you lose, um, you lose any say. So based upon how you choose to view infrastructure is going to base upon how you're going to be able to understand what layer and what application of services you can provide. So infrastructure, again, is uh, the basic physical and organizational structures and facilities needed for the operation of a society or enterprise. Right. Oh, it's funny. It's about community again. So some of the greatest cultures in history built infrastructure for the good of the public by enabling long-term commerce. They didn't build it for just the sake of having a project to build. They built it because they wanted to have long-term commerce. Um, a good example of that is the Romans built you know, aqueducts and built um, roads, and, and they used it so that they could have the trade routes. Uh, China did the same thing, they used it for trade routes. So it's always been about commerce. I thought it was interesting, Microsoft last year um, came out with commercials that were saying, when your infrastructure is ready for anything, your people are ready for anything. They immediately made that connection. I think it's struck true. So community <coughs> infrastructure is really about these sorts of things. Right away is trench and micro trench, service easements, multi purpose wire, <coughs> structured wiring, multi purpose fiber for municipal, commercial, residential services, the electronics platforms side of it, the physical space for co location of technology, how do you get it here, keep it here, keep the jobs here, physical servers, virtual servers, and a last component which is more about interfacing those services, which is an enterprise service bus, much like a um, a, a software layer, a higher layer performance. This is just a little like, a little map of Loma Linda that I threw together a few years ago. And, and what you see is a bunch of little colored dots. And those little colored dots are specific applications and services that were necessary in order for us to pick it up. So things like water metering and SCADA and traffic lights and, and all that sort of stuff. And it gives you an idea that you can invest in some backbones and you can start to